All right, folks, welcome. Oh, yeah, wait, wait. gotta get the PowerPoint up. Well, that's a nice piece of art. You don't have to worry too much. So today, what are we doing, folks? Well, we're going to start Imperial Twilight. Huzzah. Uh, it's a good book. If you haven't read it yet, it's too bad. It's well written, I would say, for a modern history book, one of the better ones. Um, and we're going to talk about James Flint and parts of the embassies of Lord McCartney to the Qing China and the Qing setting itself. And uh, we'll talk about why I'm using... Uh, Wade Giles, and not Pinying in a second. Uh, right. I'll do that. Actually, I could do it now. So, uh, welcome everybody. Yeah, this is Modern Asia. We are going to be talking about this today. Um, by the way, if you don't know anything about Chinese, um, remember when we talked about politics? So, um, even the, the way you choose to represent language is politicized in Asia. Now, what does that mean? Well, there's, there's, there's two... No, that's not true. There's three big systems. Uh, the first one, when the West encountered China, was something called Wade Giles. Basically two super, super famous, uh, sino they're called Sinologists, which is a person who studies China professionally. And they made a romanization system for Chinese that was phonetic for native speakers of European languages. That's called Wade Giles. And then after the 1949 Communist Revolution, uh, they made a system called Pinyin, which is romanization for Chinese people that is not phonetic into English whatsoever. And there's a third system, which is a hybrid that's a, it's a Mandarin pinyin for Taiwan, and it's a slightly more phonetic, but they're both pretty rough. So because I am not a native speaker of Chinese, I am using weight guiles. Now, when appropriate, I will explain the difference, but this is the easiest one to show you here. In the book, it spells Qing, Q-I-N-G. So now why would I use weight guiles? Well, because if you draw a Q in English, I'm going to say something like Qing. And that is obviously not how you say Qing, right? So, and again, I, I, my Chinese pronunciation is bad. Why? There's no real notation here in English. Uh, the apostrophe implies somewhat of a gap if you're trying to uh, make it go to Chinese clearly. But I'm going to use Wade Giles for the most part, but I will explain Wade Giles and Pinyin so all of us can kind of learn to read modern Chinese. So again, politicization, right? So even language itself gets politicized, and it's good to know. My choice is made by functionality, right? What will help the majority of people here who probably aren't a mandarin of native speakers um, say the Chinese words in a, a close approximation. That's my goal, just if you're curious. So our first political issue of the day already, hooray. So, but before we get into that, we're gonna finish a couple slides that I intended to do during Sun Tzu. So that was our last class. Um, the first one, here we go. We're gonna talk a little, about, little bit more about Machiavelli. Now, not that much more. Uh, let me make sure I open my question tabs. Here we go, yeah, yeah. Um, a little, we're gonna do a little bit more here. Um, this book, I will probably, like I said uh, before I started the class today, I will probably get a couple of chapters of this available online as part of our course reserves. It's a great book to read um, as a counterbalance to the prints, and you guys will see why in a second. So, Discourses, and the full name of this book by Machiavelli is called uh, his Discourses on Livy. Livy is a famous Roman historian. I'm, I'm looking for my book now. Yeah, the discourses on the first ten books of Titus Livy. That is the name of this. So, Niccolo Machiavelli basically writes this book. And, uh... It's the counterbalance, or you could almost say his true passion, his counterbalance to the prince. So this one... He makes an argument for republics, or representative government, or some kind of thing such as that. So the, you could argue the opposite of the prince, but it's not really the opposite, it's the complementary, and we'll talk about that now. So firstly, in this book, Machiavelli asserts a couple things. Firstly, he asserts that one reason one might ever want any kind of just or representative government, not just pure principalities, is adaptability through freedom is the key sur to survival in human society. Basically, Without any adaptability, human society will eventually collapse. Now again, is this relevant? Yes. In our class, we're going to study four famous collapses. Now when you say, what do you mean, Professor? Well, we're lit the book we're reading really, literally is called The Opium War and the End of China's Last Golden Age. 
so, so what happens after golden age not a golden age right that is a collapse uh we're gonna watch korea collapse and japan collapse and traditional vietnam and indochina right so this is one more metric by which we can judge the said collapses now he, this theory on elements of what makes kind of a republican state uh, or a or a representative state not a democracy uh, machiavelli was definitely not a democrat um and uh, many moderns are always confused about this, but in a, we've already kind of mentioned it, but in a ancient and even early modern assumption, democracy was a uh, dirty word because it didn't work. And at any time in history, it always collapsed and the mob took over. Now, what are the elements of a Machiavellian kind of state in the discourses? So first, uh, if you have any kind of representative government, this one was key for Machiavelli. First, for any government form to survive, it requires citizens to be able to vote absolute powers to dictators to defend republics. And actually, the book I have, the translator, I should give this translator credit. Um, no, no, he just wrote the introduction. The guy's name is Bernard Crick. This guy wrote an introduction. He's a Machiavelli scholar. I think he's a political scientist. And he made a great point that uh, an example of this would be we could see in the future. Uh, for example, oh, sorry. Well, this one I can give you because we're talking about the Roman times. And this class doesn't require you to know Roman times, but I can explain it quickly. Basically, in Rome, the word dictator comes from Rome, right? So in a time of war, you'd vote on a dictator. And uh, it was a year session, and you gave the dictator absolute power to fight the war for a year. And then you could vote them out. Uh, why do you need that? Because the last thing you need in a war is deliberations of a representative government. Representative government does some things right. Uh, making quick, effective decisions is not something representative governments do right. They've never done it in all of history, and they aren't going to start now. Just because we're quote-unquote modern, and they're quote-unquote classic or ancient or medieval, doesn't actually change the uh, status of this. And by the way, throughout all those periods, you can always find some example of representative government somewhere. Now, the, uh, now, so even though that need for a, we'll call it, absolute authority exists, there's some uh, there's some obvious advantages from Machiavelli's perspective of representative governments. Why? Well, these republics tend to be more flexible than principalities, since they can trust their people with arms and are adaptable. Uh, the example that the introduction writer gives, obviously not Machiavelli, right? Uh, World War II. On the surface, everybody thought Imperial Japan, uh, Germany, and Italy would win. Uh, they had the will, you know, they were more central control of their economies, and if you read the 1920s, 1930s literature, a lot of Western representative governments wanted to copy them in their effectiveness. So if this doesn't sound familiar, in the modern age, many people have said the same thing about China. Now, what's the downside of a principality, uh, strictly speaking? Well, the downside is they can't, it's the opposite of this, right? They can't actually trust their people with arms, and they are not adaptable. Strictly speaking, a principality structure, and even when we read The Prince, right, there's an obvious level of distrust in the system. So, nobody makes good decisions. People refuse to kind of uh, take responsibility for actions. I actually have a quote from here. Let me find it. Um, I'm looking at my book now. Here we go. This is a quote from the translator, but it's a good example of this. Talking about Britain and Germany during World War II. For here, the responsibility could be devolved, and men would make decisions at all levels, having been used to working as a team. Whereas the new autocracy, decisions had to wait, often with disastrous delay, for the Fuhrer, that's Hitler, right, to get around to them or be in the right mood. Failure by subordinate leader in an autocracy is usually viewed as treachery, punishable in the harshest ways. Failure in a republic is often more punished by being given a big job in a poor colony, or by innumerable forms of being kicked upstairs, locked out but not locked up. And this translator says, sometimes more is the pity. And there are, after all, grad gradations of th these things, right? It's not absolute. But there's this idea in more autocratic forms of government, 
necessarily it can't be that adaptable because fear of making decisions and you know very centralized command decision making all right and generally autocracies tend to be horrible at diffuse decision making doesn't mean they can't do it but it tends to be a big issue long term now this is interesting too this is why i say this next one is why i say machiavelli this is not a counter argument against the prince it's a complementary source well because he has makes this point princes create or restore states and republics preserve them now what does he mean uh to create or restore a state you need one strong leader with absolute kind of power otherwise that person like let's say things are worse you also have no power to make things better why because things generally to get to a like before they exist they have no institutions right so the prince has to create it exactly like machiavelli's prince or to restore a fallen state requires a prince and again why well for a state to have fallen all the institutions failed so how can a failed institution restore itself it can't right it requires external leadership so that's that's another advantage of princes so for machiavelli princes aren't moral or immoral they're necessary for certain things and they're better at certain things than others so for him he would say any kind of prince government is better for these two but republics preserve the states uh and we'll get into why he thinks that is but in generally speaking right republics have that adaptability what we just talked about right they have the flexibility and the adaptability and they're able to give absolute power when needed but take it away when it's not needed right so they're they're just generally better um there's also an idea here of like the power of consent and that's the next point um machiavelli unlike a lot of modern political philosophers who thought like the state does not exist until you consent to the state uh what's the problem with that uh that's not true on the face of it right machiavelli points out the obvious reality government precedes consent right if i'm born in the united states i don't then get a chance to di unconsent from the united states government that's not how it works but it just is right but however um governments that have consent are the most powerful and again this goes down to why republics tend to be strongest but remember machiavelli would never seen anything that strong because what if there was a principality that had the consent of the governed Machiavelli would argue it would be powerful for sure and again this should make kind of intuitive sense because uh I mean Corona is a good example right uh, if you live anywhere south of Long Beach or south right you've basically watched the collapse of government authority in terms of like uh rule compliance on mask wearing or beach going or park going or group meetings right people just didn't care anymore what does that mean it means the government's losing the consent of the people and then the rules no longer work it's a very interesting dynamic all right now this one is super edgy and uh, i'm going to mention it too machiavelli has a very different view of conflict in the one thing we're studying in this class is conflict right conflict between some communities inside a society is natural and good for a republic now in the kind of classic sensibility they this would be considered weakest but uh machiavelli kind of takes the edgy view where says this is actually useful now why does he give this example why well he basically argues something like liberty comes from these trop these conflicts so like the plebs and the no the, oh make sure i didn't kill my internet the plebs and the senators in ancient rome uh, from that we got the tribune of the plebs if you don't know what any of this is i'll explain uh and again remember this is a discourse is on a roman source he's not pretending to write everything new although a lot of it is new um but in in rome the rich so the senatorial class the, arist the aristocracy competed with the plebeians which are just the regular people citizens and through the conflict uh they got power aka liberty which the tribune of the plebs is one of these things the tribune of the plebs is like an elected it's an executive that's almost like a judge that would basically help defend the plebs from the overreach of the elites in their society and again it was a very useful role for the rest of the roman empire and the roman republic but it never would have happened if there wasn't a conflict between you know different groups in society so the idea that conflict is bad by itself 
isn't strictly a... Uh, Mikey Valley would definitely disagree. I'm trying to see here. Where's the quote I liked? Nope, there's, I can't find the quote. I like. I'll do it later. Okay, also in this, there is an Art of War comparison. Uh, and Machiavelli actually wrote his own Art of War, which we're not reading. Uh, he makes a point here. Strong military is impossible without social cohesion and a strong citizenry. So before we talked about, right, you have to be able to vote absolute power to dictators to defend republics. But if you vote for dictator and then can't defend your republic... It's irrelevant, right? There's nothing you can do. So, there's this, from a modern perspective, people could say obsessed, but if you look at Machiavelli's time and most of history, right, uh, we're always dealing with being invaded. And again, this class, we're going to speak with four examples of four different areas that get invaded. So, we'll talk about maybe Machiavelli's right or wrong here, but there's this idea that it's impossible to defend oneself without cohesion of society, right, people getting along, and a strong citizenry. And then, with all of this being true, the haves are compelled to give opportunities to the have-not. What does this mean? Uh, just like the Tribune of the Plebs, when, there's an, when all three of these are together, that we know liberty comes from conflicts, we know we have to have social cohesion and strong citizenry to have a good military, we then the conclusion has to be the haves, aka the, the aristocracy, the elites, must be compelled to give opportunities to the have-nots. Right? So, if we have a functioning society with elites that, and just, let's just say aristocrats, who understand, uh, to use the French, the noblesse oblige, right, the obligation of nobility, that they must do something to aid the have-nots, both, not just for pure, like, bribery, but as a cohesion mechanism, right? It costs them relatively little to make the have-nots feel like they have, they're part of the bigger society. Uh, I can give you a good modern example of this. Let's say there's a public university that is heavily subsidized by the taxpayer that technically costs 50 grand a year, but most people pay 5 grand for. Right? If that existed, that could be seen as a modern form of this. Now, don't get me wrong. There is a there is one political opinion that thinks all you know the, the haves in modern times, where the haves should give everything to the have-nots, or where the haves should give nothing to the have-nots. Machiavelli is neither of those extremes, right? He is just saying to have a stable society with cohesion and strong citizenry, the haves have to be actually conserved from the have-nots. And actually, the ancient Romans were very big into this. Not only did they give political positions to them, they also instead of like where we do now people like donate money to get a tax write-off the ancient romans would build public facilities with their name on them just for the public good just for the reputation like they didn't do it for any other reason and, and let's be honest for, for cohesion and to make a strong citizenry right they make public baths and amphitheaters and everything and just give them away they didn't like do it for like secret tax write-offs so this is a historically observable fact, which is very interesting too. So again, this is a strength of a republic, but one could probably also use it to analyze anything not a republic. All right, and finally, one reason, in the beginning of the class we talked about civilizing and civility, right? One reason there's always a push in societies to civilize conflict, it adds power to the state. This one's kind of edgy, but think about it. If the random people on the streets are solving their problems left through violence and instead using courts and using language and using publishing that actually gives more power to the state in the form of the state becomes the majority possessor of violence as a as a way to solve conflict which increases the power of the state again the a lot of even like the prince machiavelli's observations here are very historical now there's a couple parts i left out which i regret leaving out like the most interesting one part of his book he, he contemplates like what makes the best republic and he basically concludes that city people don't make a good republic he would make a republic any day out of like goat herders in the hills because they're cohesive they're strong citizens and they're much more like uh they're much more independent and he basically thinks that if the people are weak they need a prince that's what it goes down to the creation of a state basically a prince 
is necessary if the people are weak citizens, you have to have some kind of princely. And then with strong citizens, you can get away with the republic. Again, interesting observation. This is just kind of, we're tickling the surface of discourses. I'm not going fully deep into it, but I wanted to mention these points because they will become up in relevance at, like as soon as today. All right, any questions about this so far? Or how, like, how does it fit? I'll give us 30 seconds. Somebody asks, uh, so he's talking about republics and not principalities. I would say he's primarily talking about republics, but, like I said, it's all connected to principalities. So, for example, a republic with conflict between communities, but that managed to maintain social cohesion and a strong citizenry, is, strictly speaking, better than a principality that doesn't ha even if it had social cohesion, it doesn't have a strong citizenry. Does that make sense? Like... It can't, because there isn't a citizenry, because it's a principality. So these all happen in contrast to principalities. Somebody says, quote, so when he says civilizing of conflict, unquote, he meant something along the lines of getting the rest of society use, used to it or involved. A bit confused. So civilizing of conflict is specifically a reference to making conflict between citizens non-violent conflict. So, for example, if the plebs, the poor, do not burn down rich people's homes every time they have a complaint, that empowers the state. Does that make sense? Like, instead if they go to court, or they have a grievance, or have a political protest, or, you know, vote for a representative that, you know, tries to fix that balance, that's actually giving more power to the state implicitly. So all, all states have an interest in civilizing conflict. So, a.k.a. making conflict about words and laws, right, and political advocacy instead of violence. That's what this one means. Yep, that's a good question. I, yeah, I don't always know if I explain things clearly. It's been at least a year since I talked about this. So, sometimes I get a little rusty. Great, those are good questions. All right, if you have any more questions, type them. Now, uh, real quick... We'll do it. Um, this one's not Machiavelli. It's more of like a synthesis of everything we've been talking about. Let's see. I'm just reviewing if I want to do all of it. All right, so this is a quick slide I'm going to go through. You can come back to it for reference, especially now these videos are just online. But uh, moral ethics and principles versus power. One of the big fights of the period we're studying I would say 18th to 20th, 20th century, but especially the 20th century. Um, basically, there's a fight between morals, ethics, and principles versus power. Now, what do I mean when I say morals and ethics? Well, there's basically a fight, like, do morals and ethics exist? And really, even skeptics act like they exist. What I mean is, when you meet a pure materialist, atheist, who doesn't believe in any morals and they think they're all human-made, they still act morally most of the time, which is an interesting idea. So people just generally want... People just generally act like morals exist, uh, but people would like the flex... In my... As someone who teaches a lot of philosophy and studies a lot of history, people like the flexibility to pretend they don't exist and then can ignore them when it's convenient. Again, very Machiavellian. Uh, now, as we talked about in the first day, when we talked about kind of a code of conduct, obviously societies disagree on fundamentals, right? Individual first, community first, uh, you know, kind of the moral equivalency of all humans or tier system of humans. I see some questions. I'll finish this and get to those supplemental questions. Uh, okay, where's my click? Here we go. All right. Now, what is a principle? Well, a principle is like we already talked about, right? First principles. Like, is society designed around individuals first and in liberty, or communities first and cohesion? This is important to keep in mind. Um, also, when we're talking about morals and ethics, think about where we can apply them. As we go through the semester, uh, we, will, we will talk about these more, and especially 
you know, both Sun Tzu and Machiavelli dealt with these in their own way. Machiavelli a little bit more real politic, right? Like, He's like, at least look like you have honor and ethics, even if you don't always have it. And Sun Tzu specifically talked about traits that are for a good leader, right? And they weren't general, they were very specific. So we, we applicability is one of the things we're going to pay attention to. And then also, it's always interesting when you're in history, uh, and we're analyzing these past humans, and it's easy to judge historical people. How consistent are these principles if we look at these actors as they act? Like, how well were they, you know, good or horrible people? Let's find out. Now, another big trend that's going to come up, like we talked about. I don't talk about my politics, but necessarily the politics will happen in this class. Uh, there's a big modern fight, basically, over government power. So there's, there's two big, broad schools. Now, one school is what I'd call the communists. Now, you can call this whatever you want. Some people call them communism. They, they could be utilitarians or uh, radical liberals or you know progressives but there's this idea on one side that the government is basically unlimited power as long as good quote unquote your people are in charge and it's holy now when i say holy there's an idea that it's like sacred or better than other institutions that is one extreme right that's that's a far extreme now the other extreme is what I would say are libertarians. By the way, these are not the only two choices, folks. I'm just saying these are the extremes. Libertarians are the same except the opposite, right? Libertarians generally think all government power is illegitimate and all government power is evil, right? They're kind of, they seem diametrically opposed. Now, what is, what's the opposite view to this, or what's the other view? Well, Machiavelli and most thinkers in history, including Sun Tzu, Government power ne is necessary, and government power is. <laughs> right, they're not ascribing much to this. Uh, to, but to use some jokes I've heard referring to why both of these perspectives are funny, right? Um, so, for example, uh, if you're going to make fun of libertarians and you say there isn't a government, you know, we don't need government, and it's like, what do you call three people ordering a pizza? Right? Like, literally, as soon as you got three people doing anything, you're going to have some kind of representative institution or some kind of method to, you know, execute things. Um, and the same thing goes the other way, right? Like, if, if you believe the government is unlimited and basically perfect, what do you do when it makes mistakes? Both have the issue. Now, if you have a more Machiavellian view of the government is necessary and it just exists and you have to deal with it, I would say that's just kind of the acknowledging the non-ideal reality. Now, what's the foundation of this? Well, this foundation comes from a trick question, uh, and it's, a, it's not a pure Western one. I would say, if we're talking about like a Confucian view, and we'll get into Confucianism later, Confucius is, would say the government is like necessary and can be good or bad. It's a little more complicated. But the foundation of Machiavelli's view is a, we'll call it medieval or classic view, is uh, we're going to use a little uh, Western classics quote from a book called the Bible, is this. Uh, he said to them, render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and things that are God that are God's. Uh, this comes from a longer quote, if you're curious. Uh, what is it? Matthew 22. It's 15 to 22. And they basically try to trap them and just say, hey, Jesus, do we pay taxes? And the idea is, whose face on the coin? And he's like, Caesar's face. And he's like, okay, then you pay to Caesar's what are Caesar's and God what are God's. This is kind of the classic, uh, up until Machiavelli Western view, where some things are the government's and some things are God's. And there's a natural separation here. Uh, and this is in contrast to basically what I'd call the materialist views, these two, which is... The power, power is its own kind of morality. Like, if you have power, you can create morality. That's kind of the, the state here. And they both kind of agree. So they think the government, libertarians think the government creates morality so it's bad. And then communists think that governments create morality so it's good. And then a more nuanced view would be like, there's some things the government can do and some things the government can't do. And actually Confucian thinkers, classical Chinese thinkers, are probably closer to this one as well. Something to keep in mind. All right, now I'm going to answer the questions I saw. First one, somebody says, how would you describe social cohesion and strong citizenry? Is one more important than the other? Uh, well, Machiavelli specifically said, for a strong military. And um, when asked conditions for, I, I missed this part, I should have mentioned it. This, the conditions of what can be a republic, 
Machiavelli had a very simple rule, and this is why the military is so important. A government can, is only allowed to exist, a state or republic or principality, that can defend itself. And if you read The Prince, like we did, right? That can defend itself without mercenaries and auxiliaries, right? Without using other people's troops. That is a pure... That's allowed to exist. Anything else is just basically a colony, right? If you can't defend yourself, you don't have a real right to exist. You're just allowed to exist by your powerful neighbor who lets you pretend you exist. So that's the first route, right? So then if we know that states that only exist at the goodwill of their neighbors aren't really states in a Machiavellian sense, then military becomes super important, right? Because the only way to be a true state is to defend yourself. So then, for Machiavelli points out, just he again, he's observing history, that social cohesion and citizenry is necessary. So social cohesion just means the people in society cohere, right? They have community. They get along. They're not trying to murder each other and burn each other's stuff down. That's social cohesion, right? Uh, generally, bonus points for similar cultures and ethnicities or religions, right? Any of those where they can get along. Um, strong citizenry means specifically virtuous citizenry. And if you say, what does virtuous mean? Machiavelli is a Christian, right? So he basically means like a good Christian citizenry. So a good ethical, moral citizenry. So to have a strong you, government, you have to have a, lots of cohesion and moral citizens. That's what Machiavelli thought. Uh, somebody says, how familiar is Machiavelli with Sun Tzu? Zero. As we'll find out today, um, there was not a European, except for a couple Jesuits, who could even speak Chinese fluently. And the ones who could were normally Chinese converts. Somebody says, quote, would it be acceptable for libertarians to ascribe to some part of Machiavelli's school of thought, or would it be hypocritical? Well, nice for you, I'm not a libertarian. But I'll, I'll, say, I'll say, so there's a problem, right? The problem is, it's not a problem, but I'll point this out. Modern political philosophies leave stuff out. That's the nice way to say it. They're incomplete, which means they don't describe the world in a whole way. So it's very hard to be, for example, a consistent libertarian or a consistent communist or a consistent utilitarian. So you're forced inherently to ascribe to different parts of each, which does make you inconsistent. So that doesn't make you a bad person. Does it make you hypocritical or have some cognitive dissonance? Yes. Um, I would say it's more like cognitive dissonance. So what would my answer to you be? Uh, keep searching. Perhaps there's a better system of thought that can explain all of it in reality and not just in theoretical ideals. I'm not going to tell you the direct answer, but uh, it's good to search. That's my answer. So when, when one set of ideas does not answer your question completely, I would say keep digging. That would be my spoiler answer for you. And as we go through class, keep asking questions like that. I'm happy to allude more to more types of political philosophy. Uh, I've studied a good amount of them, uh, both modern, classic, and medieval. So as we go through, I'll try to bring more of those in. And of course, we will be bringing in Asian and Western kind of modes of political slash conflict slash moral philosophy. That's part of the fun. But I started with two because it seemed reasonable. But I'm just pointing out, more than two exist, right? These are kind of the big three in, uh, we'll say even in the 21st century, right? These are kind of the big three teams. All right, any other questions before we jump into uh, Imperial? Oh, I see a question here in the Discord. Somebody says, civilizing conflict reminds me of when Emperor Qianlong was happy to hear about the issues going on in Canton, because hearing issues is less common than issues being hidden. Uh, yeah, exactly. So. Well, yeah, that's even more just like, uh, I mean, he does end up cutting somebody's head off, right? So uh, he still has pretty decent punishments, but it's, he is the state, so he's allowed to do it. But it's even more like it's showing that perhaps he doesn't have as much coherency as he, or cohesion as he'd like, because he would have liked to have heard that there's corruption from his own people, which he didn't hear, which means the whole system itself is corrupt because he never heard it. <laughs> but uh, we'll get to that. Great, uh, I don't see any other questions, so let's jump on in. I'm gonna close this one. Where are you? Here we go. Boop. Okay, now we're gonna start this one. And as I predicted, we are not getting to page 70. And I'm not gonna rush it. Um, 
at least one person read some of this right if you didn't read it yet my goodness this book for a history book is one of the easier reads i've ever seen it's a great book um and by great i mean it might not be the best history book in the world history but it is one of the better written books i've ever seen why are you there we go oh i closed it i killed it folks give me one second all right and okay and there we go that's what i wanted fantastic something on the back end you can't see that made me happy all right so let's get into this uh kind of the introduction of the setting and a little bit on james flint the sad sad story of james flint so in imperial twilight this book we're going to use uh what are we looking at what's the time period who are we covering what's the author trying to do and i do really like this author doing this intro he did if you didn't read it yet you're missing out uh it's great he basically does a walkthrough of canton right the first the introduction is just called introduction colon canton uh and if you have your book and i don't have my document camera sadly uh if you have your book you can look at page uh, roman numeral 10 right and we get the pictures wonderful maps in this book too hand drawn i think uh, I miss good old hand-drawn maps. Um, they might not be, though. They look like hand-drawn maps, though. Um, if you don't know where Canton is, it's South East China, right? It's uh, now near modern Hong Kong, but not quite, in Guangdong, right, in the south. Uh, and we get a little bit of this. And the question this book is trying to answer, by the way, most important, how the Opium War came to be, both the decline of China and the victory of Great Britain. So how did this happen, right? And where? what's our setting? What is going on? Uh, for the setting part, I don't, almost don't want to spoil it, but if you read the introduction, you get a very lively description of kind of imagine a Westerner walking through 18th century Canton. Uh, my favorite part, and by favorite I mean it's good to remember history, uh, the foreigner wasn't actually, the western foreigner wasn't allowed to enter the city, probably small children would have chased him out of town, and uh, it talks about pigeon English a little bit on, what is this, Roman numeral 18, where we learn where we get a lot of these words in English that nowadays some people think are offensive, but they're actually, a, it's actually its own language invented by southern Chinese people. Uh, it's basically, what is this, pigeon English is a hybrid of Cantonese mixed with European tongues and it has Chinese grammar and pronunciation. So it's like a hybrid English that was invented whole cloth by traders in Canton, which is still encountered somewhat in Hong Kong, actually. So, an interesting thing. Now, getting into this book, kind of the meat, you guys should read the first half, the introduction yourselves. It's a great little description that I don't want to spoil. Um, but the book actually asks a moral question. And this is one reason we talked about kind of ethics, morals, how things are, or how they should be. Uh, the moral question of this book was how Britain could have come to fight a war which is heavily criticized at home and abroad. Hmm. So what is this kind of laying out is the Opium War is more conflicted than the history tends to say. And if you read the intro, it even talks about how, uh, right, it says uh, the very top of, this is uh, Roman numeral 23, no event cast a longer shadow over China's modern history than the Opium War and sparked by an explosive series of events that took place in the Canton factory in 1839. The war ended in 1842. It led to China's humiliating defeat in the treaty, all but dictated the British aggressors, setting a disastrous pattern for a century to come. And then most modern books start here. He mentions that too. Quote, unquote, modern books. They don't really explain how it happened. They just start, the open war is, it was inevitable, here we go. And then what the Chinese call a century of humiliation was signed, you know started now why is this relevant because only in hindsight is kind of the victory the victory of the uk seemed inevitable so this is where you have to be very careful in history and i'm going to warn you of this the whole semester if you've ever and i once that one positive of corona virus and this whole panic and everything being up in the air and that chaotic feeling you feel i'm going to spoil it for all of you that's how history always feels no except for very perceptive you know very peaceful humans most humanity have felt like this all of history right we don't actually know what's going to happen nobody can predict the future economists can't scientists can't historians can't we can make educated guesses at best a coin toss and if you have lots of logic 
and truth maybe 60 percent so it's good to know that because kind of the chaos of decision making is always present in every single one of these events we're going to study just keep that in mind that kind of chaotic not knowing the future feeling you might feel right now that's all of humans forever and ever all of history unless you believe in prophets or something except for them you know everybody else you're trapped like the rest of us now this is both it could sound depressing but it's actually good to know because in kind of the retelling sometimes history is over it's it's written with too much ideology in it so like this is this would be a, an answer that has too much ideology in it right the only in hindsight does the victory of the uk seem inevitable that is kind of a progressive historical view which in the 19th century would have been called whiggish right it's this idea in british history that where england was in the 19th century was inevitable with all the previous events and it had to progress to this point that was not the case on the ground now why not well firstly it's easy to forget china had all the cards in trade basically england for 150 years tried to open china to trade china refused <laughs> they're like you can trade in one city half the year and if you don't like it you can leave and china was bigger population wise it was richer it was seen to have a stronger military and we'll talk about that uh plant does not talk about it but we will and one reason we will is and somebody said quote we're doing you a favor unquote yeah if you didn't read introduction and uh james flynn they literally send a bragging letter to the king of england after arresting a british citizen saying we could have been more brutal you should thank us for our generosity <laughs> <laughs> and yeah trade was seen as a favor they're doing to lesser nations and that's not like me paraphrasing i mean that's not me making putting words in their mouth that's that's how they approach trade and we'll talk about the system but it was seen china was seen to have all the cards and inside china and even outside china um but especially the the kind of domestic view was war itself was impossible because of the profit of trade that each side was getting everything they like the british were getting what they wanted and that the chinese were getting so much money everybody's like there's so much money we could not ever like war could never happen because of all this trade where have you heard that before everybody <laughs> i'll tell you a secret not to make you depressed but before every major war in the last forever but especially the last 200 years right we have more modern philosophy everybody always says there couldn't be a war because of trade let me give you an example so there's a big war called world war one and everybody said there could never be a war because of trade uh before world war ii there could never be a war because of trade <laughs> there's more wars too but yes somebody says i feel like their mentality hasn't changed not really uh, somebody says is this liberalism we will talk about it but would it shock you that the people who pushed for the opium wars are a group called uh um they were called free traders you've probably never heard that before but we will get into that uh the opium wars considered the quote unquote first victory of free trade unquote so uh yes we will be getting into that don't you worry now this is also uh and again it's imperial twilight right this is the decline of china's greatest empire and from a 21st century perspective this is quite important uh when you're looking kind of at china today so we're looking at china a hundred years past the collapse of the qing right let me do my math yeah it's about 100 years so it's been about 100 years since the collapse of the qing who took 100 years to collapse um and it wasn't just a chinese empire it was the greatest chinese empire in all of chinese history and it was a line of chinese empires stretching back 2500 years right so there's this giant imperial tradition that's it's not just money and people right it's this gigantic civilization this dominant world civilization collapsing and that decline is that's why it's called twilight right there's the end of this golden age and there's something there that we need to wrestle with all right also um it was the crossing of two great empires that's what this point was right this is the ascendancy of the british and the decline of the chinese so we get this kind of conflict this is where we're having a conflict class right we had this meeting of the two greatest empires and almost immediately after winning this right the british went on to become 
they entered their golden age, which you could argue was probably almost 100 years. Yeah. From maybe the Opium War, World War II, is kind of the 100 years of the Victorian age of uh, the United Kingdom, which was its pinnacle, we could say. All right. So this is kind of setting the groundwork. Any questions for this before we get a little bit into James Flint? I don't know if we'll finish James Flint, but I really want to start it today. And I'll give it 30 seconds. That is loud. I have a, a little gauge for my sound and clicking my pen pushes it to the loudest spectrum. That's louder than my voice, my goodness. All right, that's 30 seconds, let's keep going. Oh, somebody asked a question. So the, so is the biggest takeaway the difference between the two empires? Um, yes, but more specifically, uh, tw uh, I would say Platts life skill um oh hey i know that guy hey everybody's welcome to hang out if you're just a random person but uh so the biggest kind of uh, if platt besides his prose he's a very good writer his second skill is he's a great character writer he gets these historical characters and turns them to living people so it's even the biggest takeaway is like who were these people on e and he does both sides he does the chinese side and the british side very well like, who were these characters that were, like, the leaders of this that got us to these points? And he really explains kind of the web of human decisions that gets to this conflict. That's the whole point of the book, and I think he does it quite well. Yeah, and it, it's also so trying to give us the ability to understand how humans make these decisions, right? And they all have incomplete data. None of this is inevitable. So, like, what mistakes were made? You know, who had principle on their side? Or who made the correct decisions? Or what are the kind of principles we're arguing over? So uh, we'll get into this more as we go. Those are good questions. Great. All right, and we're almost out of time. So let's mess around Flint a little bit. If you did not read your book, you're, oh my goodness, you should read about this poor guy. Uh, here's our first picture, by the way. This is a picture, it's a historical uh, representation of the factory district of Canton. So there's a little string of 13 foreign residences where the, they were approved living places for the Westerners. All right, so let's get into this. Okay, James Flint, this is a, a very tragic story. James Flint was a kid, an orphan kid, that was adopted by a ship captain. Um, and he was the only English Englishman who knew how to speak and write Chinese in the, uh, what was this, in 1759. But how did he get this skill? Well, uh, he was an orphan who was adopted by a ship captain. Now remember, this is way before, like, orphanages are even a common thing. Just that the, the kid's parents die and the ship captain adopts them, and the ship captain thinks, man, wouldn't it be great if I, like, can train this kid to speak Chinese uh, and the guy's name was Rigby and he basically adopts this kid brings him halfway around the world drops him in Canton and says learn Chinese and then finally after several years the captain calls him to India and on his way to India the captain dies this is his adopted father and then the, the East India Company which we'll get into that this big trading company that controls all of this has this kid, he's a teenager, like a young teenager, they have no idea what to do with him, uh, they send him back to Canton to live full time, with no money. They just put him on a boat, and he shows up. So this kid has no parents, he's a British kid, um, no parents, nobody's watching after him, he basically becomes a kind of mascot of the fa these factories in Canton. And he lives his life full time in Canton slash Macau. Now, if you're like, Professor, what does that mean? Uh, they were only allowed to trade in Canton six months of the year. The other half, they had to go to Macau, which was a Portuguese colony, also, uh, or more like a Portuguese exclusion trading zone, also in southern China, where they could live for six months of the year. So for half of this time, uh, James Flint would dress Chinese and uh, pretend to be Chinese while the British were gone. But he also went both between both towns. He started to learn Chinese well. He eventually got adopted 
by the East India Company and eventually became a manager. They're called supercargoes. It doesn't mean he, he is awesome cargo. It's someone above cargo, right? Super means above. So he's a he's a above cargo. So he's a cargo master, basically. And uh, yeah, this guy is the first Britishman to ever learn Chinese fluently. And as we learn in the book, it's mostly Cantonese reading and writing and a little bit of Mandarin. And then somebody gets the bright idea to send this kid, who's now a man, to talk to the emperor about corruption and asking if we can trade in more ports, please. Uh, so he does the classic Confucian Chinese move, which is called the redress of grievances. And his teacher, a Chinese teacher, helps him write it. And this is basically every Chinese citizen has the right to petition the emperor. And uh, Flint it gets promoted at his job to take this to the emperor. Why? Well, there's a corrupt Hapo, which is the uh, basically the minister of trade for Canton. He's he's totally corrupt and you know arbitrarily changing their prices and getting quite rich off it. And they want another trade port. So they're like, okay, we're going to pay this guy, put him on a ship, send him to northern China. Now remember, this is sailboat age, not steamship age. Now, a bad news, uh, he, has a, he gets a small ship, and it's called Success. It has like eight crew on it, I think. And they sail north. Now, if you don't know how winds work, uh, coastal winds generally go one direction in one season. So he sails up the coast of China and gets to a place called Ningbo, and they tell him, you must leave, you cannot stop here, no, we will not trade with you. And he says, but, but I need to trade. They're like, go away. He's like, I can't go south. They're like, we can't do anything for you. So he sails on, and then he gets to the kind of... He gets to the, 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 the city outside the capital, and he needs a bribe. It's basically like $200,000 in modern money. He needs a bribe to even get to see the emperor, which he reluctantly pays... And then he pay gets the bribe, he pays it, and then he's like, great, I guess the emperor. And the emperor was very appreciative. He's like, wow, uh, thank you for reporting the corrupt minister. I will be sure to deal with that. Uh, you're not going to get another trade port, though. And because you are accusing the minister, you must travel back to the province with my inspector. And, you know, this seems successful. James Flint's feeling pretty good. Uh, by the way, he does not get a sail back. And what happens to success? literally disappears from history. We have no idea what happened to this poor boat with eight people. Not a good day for a boat. Uh, now what happens after this? Well, as I said, the Emperor ex appreciates the exposure of corruption. What a nice guy. Yeah, great. Um, however, he does not trust an Englishman who speaks Chinese. So he sends a secret letter with the inspector. So they travel back by land, get back down to the south. Um, then James Flint gets thrown in jail. <laughs> and then, uh, where's that quote here? Oh yeah, that letter I mentioned from before. Uh, the Qin governor of Canton went so far as to write a letter to the king of England, extolling Chinese government's generosity in merely sentencing James Flint to prison, calling his punishment, quote, such amazingly gracious treatment that he should think of it with tears, unquote. He said that all British who come to China to trade, quote, have been so drenched with the waves of imperial favor that they should leap for joy and turn towards us for civilization. There's an exclamation point there. Unquote. Uh, poor old Flinty was uh, in jail for three years straight. Oh, and uh, what happened to his translator, by the way, or his uh, teacher? They found his teacher. They immediately decapitated his teacher and hung his head over the city of Canton's gate to remind people to not teach British men how to speak Chinese. And then poor Fint, well, after three years, was forcibly retired to England when his only skill was Chinese. And he basically disappears into history and people thought he just died. But uh, Platt actually dug around in the history and found that he was still alive and he actually even taught Ben Franklin how to, to, how to tofu. And I should have said how to make tofu, but how to tofu is so funny I had to leave it. So, there's a little introduction of the setting. If you didn't read it, obviously I'm skipping a lot of details. But, uh, this is kind of setting that tone of, like, what is 18th century China look like? This gives you an idea, right? It's exclusion, um, superiority complex munch. One, one can almost call them chauvinists, right? And a chauvinist is one who believes that their group is superior to every other group, right? One could say. Um, yeah, 
And the, the British are very differential. And why? Well, we'll get into that in the next chapter. But okay, any questions for now? We're actually out of time. I'd love to keep going. I'm getting into this, but... Uh, as the Japanese say, jiken, jikan ga arimasen. Yeah, right? You're the only British... Somebody says it's a very interesting skill set to make tofu. Yeah, and imagine you're the only British person who can make tofu in that time period. Interesting. I don't even know how you got the soybeans. Who knows? Alright. We have one more person type in a question, but I'll answer that in the, uh, in the chat. For those of you who are just watching randomly, thank you for joining us. Uh, I'll be back in 15 minutes or 20 minutes, maybe more like 30 minutes, and we'll be doing a stats class. For everybody else, uh, I'll send us out from the Discord. Have a great day. Thanks for watching, everybody, and I'll see you next week on uh, Monday. Have a great week.